Let's start off with a little review of what we covered last time. We're starting part way through the packet. Right where we let our red blood cells start, I'm going to do some questions at the beginning. So if you want, you can actually start at the beginning of your packet. So I'm going to ask you questions from the beginning, leading up to this point where we left off last time. So I started talking about the blood, gave different functions of the blood. The blood is going to transport. The main gases the blood are going to transport are what two gases? Oxygen and carbon dioxide. Good, oxygen and carbon dioxide. It can also transport hormones. Now I'm kind of jumping right to this one here. It can transport hormones. There are three proteins mainly in the blood, and one of these types of proteins is going to be the one that's transporting hormones. So if you guys can find that. So go find where there's proteins. You're going to have to skip very much into the section where it talks about physical characteristics of blood. And uh, there's going to be three different types of proteins in there. It's the most common protein that's transporting hormones. Albumin. All right, so albumin is very important. Hormones, you'll be transporting the hormones. When we get to the endocrine system, you're going to see that one again. All right, so since I jumped into that part where we're talking about the physical characteristics of blood, blood is divided into two halves. One's a little bit more than a half. What are these two halves that blood's divided into? Plasma is one. Whole blood is the main thing. So plasma is part of it. What's the other? Formed elements. The formed elements will be the blood cells. How many types of formed elements are there? Three. We have the red blood cells. What's the proper name for the red blood cells? Is it erythrocytes? Then what are the, the what's the other color? White blood cells called leukocytes, and then uh, the other one will be platelets called thrombocytes. So those make up the formed elements. Which one makes up more of the whole blood? The formed elements or the plasma? Plasma. Plasma. So plasma. Uh, contains a bunch of things, but what's the main component of plasma? Yeah, so just think about, you know, you got a bottle filled with water, but what else is inside that water? You have salts or solutes, sodium, potassium, calcium, all those. And one more thing that I, I just asked you about first, proteins. <clears throat> so we have the albumins, we have globulins, and then what's the third protein? Fibrinogens. That those are involved in what? What type of process in our blood? Blood clotting. So what type of cells are going to activate fibrinogen into fibrin? It would be the platelets. Those are the clotting. So that's going to be more focused on specifically when we get to the end of this. Not today. Another class we'll get down to that point. But again, there's the two halves. There's plasma and there's formed elements. Formed elements are the cells. Plasma, that's just going to be the water with the solids. When you think of plasma, think of a protein shape. Think of water with protein in there plus other uh, ions or electrolytes. And then the formed elements would just like be dropping marbles into there. Those would be the cells. All right, so that's physical characteristics of blood. Then we moved in specifically into the red blood cells. Again, what's the word for the red blood cells? I'm saying that because you're going to see that word used a couple more times. So erythrocytes. When you look at an erythrocyte, what is the shape of it? When you uh, see these sides pushed in like that. Biconcave, not biconvex, which you mean, what you mean the insides are actually popping out of this convex. But they're pushed or they're depressed in, like right in that area. So it's biconcave, it's thin in the middle, it's thicker on the outer edges. When you find a bunch of erythrocytes stacked together in a capillary, what's the word for that one? I think the French, the French word what? Rouleau, right? That's gonna be a rouleau. That's a stack of red blood cells inside of a capillary. What else can I ask Okay, so red blood cells, they're gonna live for how long on average in circulation? 120 days or months? Or months. So they're going to live about that long. And there's also another protein that we're going to start talking more about today that's inside red blood cells. It's very important. What is that protein that's inside red blood cells? We talked about it for a while. Hemoglobin. True or false, the abbreviation for hemoglobin is HG. What's that the abbreviation for? 
Mercury, and then I heard it, what's the abbreviation? HB, as in bone marrow. That's the one for hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is made of how many different subunits to it? There's four subunits. What are the Greek letters for those? Good, two alpha and two beta. Unless we're talking about fetal hemoglobin, how many are those going to be? Or what are the letters going to be, sorry? Two alphas and two deltas. Which one of those binds to oxygen more readily, stronger? The delta ones, the fetal. Because that's the way the oxygen is going to cross from the mother over to the fetus. Because that hemoglobin in the baby has a stronger pull. If it didn't, then the mother is always going to hold on to the oxygen and it's not going to go back. So that's one of the big differences there. And then, how many heme groups do we have in one hemoglobin molecule? There's four. You see one, two, three, four. And what's at the center of each heme? Iron. Iron. And what's the symbol for iron? Fe. Fe, right in there. So we're going to be talking about the breakdown of this coming up now. So you want to make sure you understand that. And another question as well, too, is how many oxygens can one hemoglobin molecule hold? Four. One at each heme group. One at each iron. What about how many oxygens can each heme group hold? One. So make sure you know the difference when I ask heme versus hemoglobin. This is the heme group. Basically what the heme group is, is all these chemicals with an element there in the center. So this is an iron heme group. You can have different elements in there as well too. So each heme will hold one oxygen. Each hemoglobin will hold four because there's four hemes inside of there. Any questions with that review? Okay, so this is where I left off last time. So if this is a normal red blood cell. Again, it has a bi what shape to it? Okay, you can see it's depressed in there in the center and on the other side, just like the donut, pushing it on the center. And then if you have different diseases or conditions, you can get a sickle red blood cell, such as sickle cell anemia. Uh, where sickle comes from the name of a tool. There's a farming tool called a sickle, and it's shaped like that. So this is a sickled uh, blood cell. So it's not good. It's not functioning well. It can't hold enough oxygen. And since I just mentioned that, there's one more review question to ask. What is a red blood cell lacking that it gets rid of? The nucleus. What else as well, too? I have both of them, the mitochondria and the ribosomes. So it's making room to hold oxygen. So inside here, there's not enough room to hold it because it's lost more than half of its sheet. So the body's going to want to get rid of it, but not just get rid of it, like throw it away. There's another idea I left you guys off on last time. We're going to degrade it, but there's another word. What's that? Yeah, recycle. Think of you know, your cans, your bottles, all that. All right, it may not be completely functional, but you can use some parts. So reduce, reuse, recycle, that whole idea. So where we're going to do that to these cells that are damaged are in the liver, in the spleen, and in the bone marrow. Mainly in the liver and the spleen. Now the name of these cells are macrophages. So if you break apart that word, what does macro mean? Macro means large. What would small be? Yeah, that would be an I, so it would be micro. And what's phage? What does that do? Yeah, to eat. So it's eating large things, relatively large things within the body. There are microphages as well too. Those are going to be your neutrophils and your eosinophils, but we'll get that to that another time. So macrophages, they're in the liver, the spleen, the bone marrow, and they're going to break down the red blood cells. And this is why you have this picture that we're going to look at here. So this is a summary of what we're about to look at in the picture. So I'll just tell you the summary and the picture and we'll go back and forth here. So the globular proteins, well, those are the subunits. How many subunits? Again, four. So those long protein strands, and just to go back to show you what I'm talking about, each of these long twisted strands, they're made out of protein. What are the building blocks of proteins? So that's why they're going to break down into amino acids. But at the center of each subunit, of each globular protein, is a heme. The heme has its own fate that it's going to follow, and it's going to get converted into biliverdin and then into bilirubin. So both of these are Billy. You just think of a guy named Billy, and this guy, he's green, but he changes to yellow. 
which one of these types do you think you find in your urine? Billy Meriden or Billy Mugen? Nobody pees green, I hope, right? So th this is why your pee is the color it is, is because of the breakdown of heme in there. The, actually, the breakdown of all your waste is due, the color of it is due to the breakdown of our blood cells, which you'll see in a second. So Billy Rubin, I wrote Billy Meriden, Billy Rubin, you remember that if you know what language you're yeah. So it's not directly Spanish, I believe it's coming off of Latin, but it's going to be the same. So if you have that Spanish Verde, it would be green. So Billy Verde, I don't know, a Ruben sandwich, I guess, is pea yellow or something like that. Whatever it works for you guys. And then the iron, which is at the center of each heme, that's going to be transported here by a compound called transferrin. And let's look at the visual part of this first. So I'm going to skip over these, I'll come back. So this is in your PowerPoint packet. I just printed up a larger image for you. That's the one hopefully you picked up today. If not, they're up here. Right now. So what's the word for that big cell that eats? Yeah, macrophage, macrophage, either one of those is fine. And we find these in what three organs of the body? Yeah, liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow. And it's written on that diagram as well, too. And on the previous slide, we just saw so the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow. Specifically, the macrophages, when they're in the liver, you don't need this for the exam, in case you can say it later on, they're called Kupfer cells. It's K-U-P-F-F-E-R. I'm not gonna test you on it or extra credit, but in case you see it, they're called Kupfer cells. Everywhere, if you remember, well, I'll just tell you because it'll be hard to recollect, but there are microglial cells in the, in the brain, and those ones are the ones that are engulfing pathogens. Those microglial cells, those are a type of macrophages as well, too. So uh, these cell eaters, these big eaters, they're going to take the red blood cells. So the red blood cells being made inside the bone, inside the bone marrow, it's being produced. We'll look at this process after we finish this idea here. And it's going to go into circulation. Again, for how many days is it normally going to last for? About 120 days. And then uh, at the end of that lifespan, Again, why does it have a relatively short lifespan? Why not a long one? Yeah, it doesn't have the nucleus inside of there. So it's going to go to be degraded, and it's going to be broken down. Heme, hemolysis. What's lysis mean again? The cut or to break down. So it's going to hemo... Uh, I can't say that word. Hemolyze? I can't say that word. But it's going to lyse. So anyways, uh, we're going to get the amino acids. Where are the amino acids coming from? the sides back. The proteins. The globular proteins. The globular proteins are going to break into amino acids. So that's one shape. Then we have the heme. we got to do something with that. Well, uh, one of them, we'll go to a shorter route first. We'll take iron. Iron is going to be transported. You notice the symbol for iron is Fe. So it's going to be transported by transferrin. Transport, trans. Ferrin, that's what iron in, is, is in iron, ferritin. So it's going to transport iron, there's the Fe. So it's just a molecule to help transport it. We're going to go back and we can make uh, some more red blood cells. Amino acids, we can also use that not just to make lobular proteins. Where else do we have proteins in the body? How would you eat proteins? Muscles, right? You can go back and use them to make more muscle, skeleton, cardiac, and the third one is smooth muscles to go back and make muscles. So we are recycling, reducing, reusing all this stuff right here. And then uh, now the heme itself, so the heme being all these, uh, this yellow, that whole yellow area, all those elements together. The heme is going to go Billy Verde, the color is Billy Verde. And they should have changed the color of the next arrow, Billy Rubin as well. So all this, it looks like it's saying it's not happening in the liver and not happening in the spleen as well. But it could be happening right inside the liver. They just took that out. So it's going to be there. And then the bilirubin is going to go and then through the circulatory system make it to the kidneys and then excrete it and make the urine to be a yellow color. And then the other fate, and I'm not testing you on this part, but it's, it can be stored. And there's a little organ in here. You can remove it. What's that? The gallbladder. That's where it's going to store uh, those billies in there. That's why you get the, the green color, and it's not completely uh, 
uh, field of movement. So, and then it's going to be secreted, and uh, this is what we would call bile. And now I'm going to the digestive system a little bit. If uh, if you don't have your gallbladder, what type of foods do you have to stay away from? Mm -hmm. Fatty foods, because that's going to be used now to break down fat. They call it emulsify. Not completely dissolve, but to break it apart. It's kind of like having a marshmallow and pulling it apart to pieces, so you're increasing the surface area. So that's now it's going to be useful. So then that's digestive. We'll come back to that in the next unit. But as well, it can go and it goes into the large intestine, into the colon. It gets converted into different other types of bilies, like urobilins, stercobilins. What color do you think these guys are? Brown. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> no. All right. They're going to be making the colors of your waist that are coming out. It poops brown. So that's why it has that color. So that has uh, it, all those colors again are coming from the breakdown pretty much of heme as color, causing the color of the waist. Yellow, Billy Rubin. Other ones, Eurobillin, Sterical Billins. But I'm just asking you about Billy Rubin and Billy Verdes. Those are ones you just have to be um, focused on. Excuse me, focused on. So if I go back here, you see iron is going to be transported, etc. Uh, there's there's two other conditions here that can happen: hemoglobinuria, hematuria, not written up here, glucosuria, uh, proteinuria. What is that urea referring to? Just the first one there. Urine. What are we finding in the urine? For example, glucosuria means what are we finding in the urine? Glucose. You shouldn't find that in urine. It should get completely reabsorbed. It gets filtered at the glomerulus, but it's supposed to be reabsorbed back at the proximal convoluted tubule. But if you find it, usually what type of people, patients have glucosuria? Diabetics. That's where the word diabetes mellitus comes from. Mellitus means honey sweet because the urine has uh, glucose in it. So going back here, now you can see it's a hemoglobin urea. It means you're finding hemoglobin in the urine. Hematuria means you're finding the whole red blood cell in the urine. Which one of those conditions means you're finding something larger in the urine? Hematuria, hemoglobin urea. Hematuria, that means you're finding the whole red blood cell. Each red blood cell has a quarter billion, 250 million uh, hemoglobin molecules inside of it. So if you do 250 uh, million times, how many does each hold from oxygens? Four, this times four, a billion oxygen molecules per red blood cell. So, uh, regardless, these these are small. So, what I'm trying to get at is, let's say somebody's given a hypotonic IV solution by mistake. It was one of the things I did in the videos. Uh, it was like killing a patient type thing, and uh, they get a hypotonic IV solution. A hypotonic IV solution is going to do what to a blood cell? going to make it burst and get larger. So that type of person would end up with blood in their urine. But blood in their urine just means it's colored red. You don't know which one it is. Which condition would they end up with? Hematuria or hemoglobinuria? The first one, yes. Because when the red blood cell bursts, it's going to release the hemoglobin into the urine. Right, it can, if it's bursting, you don't have the whole red blood cell anymore. But if to find the whole red blood cell, there's a condition called glomerulonephritis. What's the itis referred to here? Yeah, inflammation specifically of the glomerulus, which means if you have like a sieve or a colander and the holes get larger in there, and the whole red blood cell can fit through there. Normally, the red blood cell can't fit through the glomerulus because what's the characteristic of the red blood cell? It's too large. Yeah, it's too big, it's too large, it can't fit through. It's like pasta is not supposed to filter out because it's too large. But you damage that sieve and that membrane, glomerulonephritis, then it's going to get through. So if people have conditions like that, then they'll end up uh, with hematuria. Now, there is uh, another thing to add on to here. So transferrin is just it's a molecule that's going to help transport the iron to wherever it's going to go, mostly to the bone marrow. And when it gets stored, it gets stored as these two compounds. Ferritin, just meaning the iron, and not too much to say here. Just these are storage compounds. 
and hemosiderin is just another storage compound as well too. So where is that visually on your diagram? Well, as the iron is being transported, it's being transported by transferrin, it's going to be stored as ferritin and hemosiderin. But the way to remember that is just take trans out of it. What's transporting? The trans one, transferrin. And the other two, those are going to be in storage. It's going to clump them up in storage until they need to be used later on. So not too much visual to show you there. Now, uh, what's that condition called when somebody has yellow skin? Jaundice. Jaundice. So what Billy is causing that? Bilirubin. It's a buildup of bilirubin. Where is one of the big locations of somebody's jaundice that you can see it? The eyes. Where specifically in the eyes do you can see it? Sclera. Okay. In the sclera. So uh, in the sclera, you can see it because, yeah, it's white. Because when the blood flows there, you can see a nice yellow color against the background of a white background. So you see that color. In the skin, yeah, but not as much because there's already other coloration going on there. So the white areas is where you can see it the best. So that's just due to a buildup um, because the liver is being overworked. Uh, if you guys go out and you drink too much, then you're overworking your liver. So there's going to be a backup. Also, if you have gall what, what it's called? Gallstones. They're going to cause a blockage. And then it's going to back up, go through your inferior vena cava, which we'll get to we'll talk about uh, veins in the next lab. Go back to your heart, right? You truly circulate. So you're putting a lot of bilirubin into circulation. Uh, versus having it being excreted. So it's being overwhelmed because the liver can't uh, work as much. It's working to break down alcohol, it's working to fight virus, bacteria, whatever things are happening to block it, overwork it, and it's going to end up going into the rest of the circulation. So that jaundice is, it just means you have a lot of bilirubin. Usually you're looking at the level of the liver. Something's going on there, whatever the condition may be. Any questions with that part? So that's definitely an important part. Just use that diagram, explain things for yourself, like go through, say, okay, the red blood cells going here, where the amino acids come from, all right, well, ethene, how is that getting there? Why is this going here? Like all those things. So just keep asking yourself those steps going off of that diagram. And I'll also give you practice questions as well, too. All right. So erythropoiesis, so what type of cells are we talking about here again? blood cells. All today we're talking about the red blood cell. We're not even going to finish it. So what's the PO refer to? Remember, hematopoiesis, hemopoiesis, to build up, to make, to form. So this is talking about the formation of red blood cells, erythropoiesis. And it's saying uh, it's going down the myeloid tissue way because we have two ways we can go down myeloid or lymphoid. We're to see that, and if you want, again, you should make yourself a big diagram in case I forget, is all the way at the beginning, that chart right here. We start off as a hemocytoblast. It's a stem cell. Where in the body do we find this hemocytoblast? Yeah, good, in the bone marrow. So it's in the bone marrow, and it has two things. It can go one way, or it can go the other way. If it goes the lymphoid way, it's just going to make a lymphocyte. This is all the way at the beginning. And uh, if it goes this way, it's going towards the myeloid direction. Which one of those two lineages produces more cells, I think? The myeloid. If you look at the myeloid, it divides into three here, and this way, and then you divide it out here. You're ending up here with one, two, three, four, five, six of the seven are coming from the myeloid lineage. The only one is the lymphocyte coming from the lymphoid lineage, which makes sense. So now I'm going to go all the way back down there. So the erythrocyte, we're going to be following uh, that path going down here. If you're going down any way, it's called hemopoiesis. It's making a blood cell. But if you're specifically talking about going down this pathway, then that's what, what poiesis? Okay. Erythropoiesis. So right here, erythropoiesis, we're going down the myeloid way. We start off with the cell all the way to the top. That's the hemocytoblast. And uh, just... There's one more thing to fill in here. Right, the lymphoid stem cell, that's the lymphocyte. The myeloid stem cell is the erythrocyte, which is the red blood cells. 
There's four of the five white blood cells, and there's one more cell missing as well. Yeah, it's the platelets. So they're going very much more <coughs> under the mile. So the platelets are going to be under the mile. is only going to be the lymphal sites, which is one of the five white blood cells. Now this is important. I should have highlighted this as well, too. The image for this is on the next slide. And it's the stages of erythropoiesis, of forming red blood cells. So there's actually one more cell that comes right before the myeloid stem cell. Hopefully you guys can figure this one out now. What's the one that comes right before the myeloid stem cell all the way at the top? Yeah, the hemocytoblast. Heme, blood, cell, blast, beginning, beginning cell. So right up before that, you have hemocytoblast. Then you'd have myeloid stem cell, pro-erythral, erythroblast, reticulocyte, mature red blood cell. Uh, just so you can get an idea of where these words are coming from. Pro, what does that mean? Before. What comes first, the blast or site? Blast, beginning. And if you use, use the alphabet, that might help as well too. So uh, before, a beginning red blood cells. There's a lot of befores in that. And then here you get rid of the first one, so then it's just an erythroblast. Then right over here, you're going to lose the nucleus in between these stages. You'll see that coming up. It becomes a reticulum site, and then it's going to enter circulation, becoming a mature red blood cell. Now, that whole process takes about a week to happen. Again, where is this whole thing starting? Uh, bone marrow. So that's where it's beginning, is in the bone marrow. So we're going to start off in the bone marrow. You're going to progress through a couple days here. After a week, you're going to have your mature red blood cell. These are extra specific things so I'm not going to really worry about. We'll talk about them a little bit in the lab. Uh, basophilic, what's phil referred to? Uh, it's a Greek word. What is it? Yeah, affinity like. Like, um, if you think of hydrophilic, right? hydrophilic means likes water. So basophilic likes the stain, this basic stain that creates that dark blue, sometimes purplish color around it. What's polychrome? Polychrome mean? Many colors. Polychromatic. So this one, the, the cytoplasm, has much coloration to it, different amount of colors. So it's going to progress through these stages. It's ejected the nucleus, but again, not just the nucleus, the other two things. Yeah, mitochondria and ribosomes. So if you want, you can jot that down there as well, too. So the nucleus will eject the mitochondria, the ribosomes, and now it's a reticular site. And then finally, once it does that, it's going to be released into circulation, and now it's a mature red blood cell. And then for how long is it going to stay again for us in our circulation? Mm -hmm. yeah, 20 days, or four months. And then at the end of that period, what organs is it heading to? Right? So that was the fate. So there's three of them. And liver, spleen, bone marrow, what cell inside of there is going to be the large eater? The macrophage is going to eat it up. The iron is going to be transported by what molecule? Transferrin. The, uh, the, the protein parts, the globular proteins, are broken down into you know, acids. And the heme, what color, what guy is going to be first? Green. And Billy Verdon, and then Billy Rubin. Just the way to think about that is what's got to be at the end? What do you got to get rid of? What color? You got a P yellow, right? It's not good. So Rubin's at the end, Verdon is going to be before that. So that's the life of it, and then we restart that whole cycle. And there's uh, some vitamins that you need here as well, too. You have vitamin B12 vitamin B6, and folic acid. These are important vitamins used along with that whole erythropoiesis, that whole maturation pathway that help to stimulate uh, the production of the mature red blood cell. Folic acid is also very important for women of childbearing age to take because uh, they found out that babies from mothers that weren't taking folic acid had a greater chance of developing a condition of the spinal cord that's coming out of the back. I don't know what that one is. 
Sure you've heard of it. Yeah, spinal bifida. Scoliosis would be the curved spine. I, I just to repeat that because I heard somebody ask, is if the spinal cord is coming out of the back of the baby, that's called spinal bifida. So if uh, mothers weren't taking that, they found that the babies weren't taking folic acid, the babies had a greater chance of developing spinal bifida. So folic acid is a very important one to take, uh, along with, you know, of course, all the other vitamins. But you can think of, you think of blood, blood cell development. But lots of other important factors as well, too. All right, so I'll just two slides ahead. Talked about this guy last time. Not the guy on the moon. But yeah, Lance Armstrong. Was apparently, he was accused, I don't know if he was actually found guilty, but of taking EPO. EPO is erythropoietin. So now you know what that erythro refers to, to the red blood cell. Poietin, what's that again? To build up, to make, to form. So he's taking a hormone that's gonna help form to develop the red blood cells. Because we start all the way at the beginning, a hemo, what? It's a tumor, hemocytoblast. And we have different ways we can go. But to influence, to go down that other way, you might look at your chart and you'll see it says EPO all along that pathway. It's a hormone being secreted from the kidneys, specifically from the uh, granulosa cells and other cells as well too, from the juxtaglomerular apparatus right by the glomerulus. Regardless, it's coming from the kidneys and it's gonna be secreted to influence the production of red blood cells. If you have more red blood cells circulating throughout your blood, how does that serve as an advantage to you? What's that? More oxygen. You can grab more oxygen from the air and then um, circulate it to your muscles. So you have higher energy, make more ATP in your mitochondria. So uh, erythropoietin is normally being produced in your kidneys, but if you're taking it uh, outside, like IV route, then that's obviously gonna be illegal for competing in athletics. But there's a regular way that you can do it naturally that's legal for Olympic athletes or any athletes in general. What type of environment? When you go up to high altitudes. When you go up to high altitudes, what's the uh, oxygen environment up there? It's low oxygen, hypoxic conditions. Yeah, there's hypoxia. So because of that low oxygen conditions, your body's gonna do a lot of things to help. It's thinking, okay, maybe I need to pump my blood faster. Maybe I need to increase the pressure. But one of the other things is saying, maybe I don't have enough red blood cells. So let's make more red blood cells so we can carry more oxygen. So you can do that. Eventually, once you go back down to sea level, it starts to go away. So you just, you gotta do it like right before the competition for an extended period of time. And then you gotta go before your body gets rid of those again and adjust. So uh, disease as well too thinking of uh, emphysema or different pneumonia, lung conditions. Wherever the body's not getting enough oxygen, it feels, it's gonna do everything it can. And one of it is to make more red blood cells to uh, circulate more. So EPO is a very important hormone that you need to know that's stimulating the production of red blood cells and also know when it's stimulated, just in general, is that gonna be in high or low oxygen environments? In low oxygen environments, hypoxia. Oh, the word be for a lot of oxygen, not, not hypo, but for oxygen. Okay, so any questions before we get into blood typing? This is still erythrocyte I'm talking. So blood typing, how many different blood types are there? It's four, what are they? You guys set them in. A, B, A, B, and O. Technically, there's eight blood types, because what else can you say about them? Good. What, does anybody know the name of that factor? The RH factor. So there's eight. We're not gonna get into RH today, we'll get into RH next time. This part is pretty interesting to have, uh, I guess a relatively creative way to hopefully present it to you guys. And, uh, so blood types are genetically determined. We'll talk about how that comes about as well too in another class, most likely next time. And it's determined by the antigens that are on their surface. So there's, there's three types of antigens. There's the A antigen, 
There's the B antigen, and there's the RH antigen, also called the D antigen, which we'll talk about that one next time. So these are your four blood types, A, B, AB, and O. And it's telling you what antigens are on them. We're about to do some drawing now, so you can also get out a piece of paper. But the antigens, or you can draw on the back of the hand while I gave you. The antigens are name tags on cells. For example, if you were to look at a cell underneath a microscope, you stained it, you did all you could, you look underneath, like, oh, that's an erythrocyte. That's a white blood cell. You know that just by looking at it. But the question is, how does another cell know what the other cell bumps into is? So you look at the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is a phospholipid blood layer. Bilayer, good. With embedded and dispersed, what type of things are in there? Proteins. And then there's also carbohydrates. Uh, there's the glycocalyx. There's um, proteins connected to carbohydrates, chain of sugars. So that would be a glycoprotein. Those things sticking out from the cell, just like little spokes, those are name tags. So one cell runs into another, it bumps in, and they recognize each other. So it, just like if you're, I don't know, at a party or something, or some gathering and people have name tags on. It's like, hi, I'm John, okay, we see each other. What's up, Phil, whatever. So these are like name tags. Antigens are name tags on cells, protein name tags. So if you have a name tag with the letter A, you're blood type A. If you have a name tag with the letter Bob, you're Bob. If you have Adam and Bob, you're Adam Bob. So those are name tags. So if I ask you what antigen is on a B red blood cell, what's the answer? It's a B. So AB is going to have both of them. O is going to have neither of them on them. Okay, so now we're going to start doing uh, a few illustrations here. So if you want different colors, you can use different colors. Okay. Put this in focus first. I'm going to make a little legend up top here, or a little key. I'm going to make antigens. This circle, we have to focus that. This circle is going to represent the A antigen. What's this triangle going to represent then? Good. The B antigen. And uh, we're going to have two other things that we're going to, we're going to add the antibodies in a moment. We'll, we'll deal with the antigens first. So, excuse me. We're going to make our, okay, how many blood types again? Four. We're not talking about RH yet, so we'll do the four. What's the first one if we do alphabet? A. What's the next one? And then A, B, and yeah, Good. And then I'm just going to draw a circle to represent the red blood cell in each of those. And we're going to talk about what's on each of those red blood cells. Okay. So, I don't know if you guys saw the video for the, the YouTube one I made for the heart. I did different levels and different steps. It's the same thing we're doing here, different steps. So, the first step is name your blood types. A, B, A, B, and O. The next thing, decide what antigens are on each of these. So, the red blood cell is going to have which antigen on it. Good. So that's the name tag. So it has A. It has more than one, but just I'm simplifying things right now and just drawing one. What antigen is going to be on the B blood cell? B. What antigen on AB? A and B. What's that? Yeah, both of them would be on A and B. And which one is on the O? None of them. Okay. Good. So that's the next part. Any questions here at this point? So it gets confusing now when we start to add the antibodies in there. So let me first tell you the idea of an antibody. So when you have an antibody, let's say I draw antibody over here, just down here a little bit. Um, antibodies tend to have this shape from the alphabet, which is an upside down upside down one. Right? They, they look like a Y. I'm just using upside down. You can put it right side up, but they have this Y appearance to them. The antibodies, think of anti. What is something here if it's anti? A 
against, against a body, the body being the antigen. So the parts that bind are these two parts here, and they're specifically designed to fit what they're going after. That's why I drew the different shapes. For example, this one, I'm drawing a semicircle here. So this antibody is going to go against which antigen? It's going to go against A. So this is anti-A antibody. You can abbreviate antibody AB. You can also abbreviate it IG, which is used more often. And you want to know that because we'll talk about what that is. You might know IG is immunoglobulin. Yeah, there's different types of immunoglobulin. There's five. M, A, G, D, and A. But we'll talk about that later. So uh, when we're talking here of this antibody, this is an anti-A antibody because what's going to happen is it's going to find an A antigen and it's going to bind to that A antigen. And it will bind to it here. Now, the A antigens are, uh, well, they're on the red blood cell. Let me see how I'm going to draw this. Let me draw another antibody first. So we put another one in here, just like this. And, okay, so the red blood cell would be like here. And then let's say we had another one over here on another red blood cell. And then here on a red blood cell. And then over here, etc. You can keep doing this over and over. Why is this bad if it happens in the blood? If you have all these antibodies binding to all these agents, you keep going and keep going, what's going to happen in the blood? Yeah, it's going to clot. Yeah, it will become too big. So all these cells are now clumping up together with all these antibodies, and you're inside the blood vessel and you're making this big clot. That's what happens when we get a wrong transfusion. We'll get to the transfusions in a second. But you don't want that to happen. You don't want the antibodies of the blood to bind to your own your blood cells because it's going um, it's gonna to make a clot. Now, I'm going to give you the word for clot here that I want you guys to get used to. I'll start asking you a couple times. It's going to agglutinate. Agglutinate. Think of glue coming together. So it's going to agglutinate. The noun agglutination. So you don't want agglutination to happen. So let's go here into our person with blood type A, our person with blood type B, person with blood type AB, person with blood type O. We're going to decide what type of antibodies are going to be in there. So in person with blood type A, would you find? Oops, sorry. Let me let me make let me make the other legend up here. And this is going to be uh, anti anti A antibody, and then just change the bottom to another triangles. It's going to be anti B antibody. Yeah. So a person with blood type A. Would you find normally anti A antibody in there? Person, sorry, it takes a while to think. A person with blood type A, would they have anti A antibody in there? Why or why not? Okay, you guys come to the other at the same time. Is no, because it would clot their blood. What's that word for clotting again? Agglutinate. So you can't have that. What about, would there be agglutination with anti-B antibody? No. So a person with blood type A has anti-B antibody in there. I drew the anti-B antibody. So a person with blood type A has anti-B antibody. So it's not a problem. They won't agglutinate. So what I want you guys to discuss with each other right now, I'll take a few minutes, is to figure out what antibodies are going to be in B, A, B, and O. So discuss it with the person next to you. If you need to start, let me all come over. Take a minute or two and think about it. 
So let's uh, go at this here. So what antibody are you going to find and what type B? Anti-A. Anti what would happen if you had anti-B in there? What's clot mean? It would agglutinate. So you could, you could, you'll could you have anti-A with a blood type B. So if you didn't, it would agglutinate and then it would lyse possibly as well too. You would destroy the red blood cells. Hemolyse or hemolyse or cancer. But anyways, so you, you can't have an antibody against the C8 antigen. I'll give you a creative way to remember this. So, what about over here in AB? None. If you have anti A, it's going to go against the oops, sorry, it's gonna go against the A antigen. If you have anti B, it's going to go against the B antigen. So, you have no antibodies over here. If you want, you can write no antibodies somewhere. And then over here, and O, you can have both of them because there's no antibodies to attack. So you can have both the anti-A and the anti-B. So you can have them both there. So what's a creative way to think about this that tends to be helping people? Well, I got a little crazy thinking about this. Decided to draw some faces in here. All right. These are happy people. It's New Year's. What are these things? Nice. Uh, they're hats. So you have two different types of hats you can wear. The hats are your name tag. That's the crazy guy with the circle hat. That's the guy with the pointed hat. Okay, so that's 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 your name tag, your antigen. So then there's these antibodies. The anti meaning what? Okay, so there's haters at this party. <laughs> they they hate the hat that you're wearing. Do you want somebody who hates your hat in the room with you? No, you don't want him there. So you can have a different hater. I'm like, I don't care. You can hate Joe. Uh, he's not here. Whatever. So this is going to be, or Bob, I guess I would say. So this would be, you would have what type of antibody with blood type A? You'd have anti B in there. So blood type B, you have a B antigen, but you have anti A. Do you want any hater when you got both the hats on? Look, you're really going to die then. So you don't want any of that. And then blood type O, they can be here. But it doesn't matter because you're not wearing the hats anyway, so you're fine. So that, that's like a creative way to think about it. Now, hopefully that's going to help you out with blood transfusion. That's the next thing that we're going to do and uh, the last topic we're going to talk about today. So with blood transfusion, there's another little mnemonic here. Hopefully this helps you to remember. Is There's three R's. When you receive, when you receive blood, you receive red blood cells. Okay. When you're receiving blood, you're receiving red blood cells. That's saying, if blood type B is going to donate to blood type A, 
only donating the red blood cell, not the white. So how does that happen? Well, if you take blood, I didn't ask you this in the beginning, but I'll ask you now, and you spin it. What is that called? Yeah, centrifuge, that would be centrifugation. If you centrifuge it, that's the verb. So you centrifuge the blood. It separates the blood components based upon what? Weight, but more specifically, density. So, um, so you're gonna separate on basic on densities. The erythrocytes are those the most or the least dense? Most, so they're gonna settle down at the bottom. So you're gonna take that part, you're not gonna take the plasma up top. So you donate just the red blood cells. Because if you donate plasma, plasma has proteins. One of the three proteins is immunoglobulins, which are your antibodies. So you're donating just the red blood cells. So when you're receiving, you're just receiving the red blood cells. So only the guy is going over to the party. When you go to the party, do you want to take the hater with you? No, you're just going to go yourself over there. Are there any haters waiting over here? No. So is this guy going to have a problem? No, so B can donate to type AB. So what I want you guys to think about are two. two. Can, can you go from A to AB, discuss this with each other, and can you go from AB to A? So can A donate to AB and can AB donate to A? I want you guys to discuss it and I'm going to ask you here in a moment. Talk about the RH factor. 